Come on now. We are all sufficiently uncomfortable in the moment. And let's be honest, we're all in our homes. We're on our computers, we're on our TVs, we're on the sources where normally the entertainment happens, but in the confines of church, in the context that we are in right now, I'm just telling you, I'm in an empty room right now, and it is uncomfortable. And to be honest, what I just showed you, normative for our society is pretty mild. I mean, I actually had an idea that I was going to show you a little bit of the music video of the most popular song of the summer. Uh, It's a song called WAP by Cardi B. Now, parents and grandparents, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Later, talk to your kids. Even your elementary age kids, they know exactly what I'm talking about. You can go online, just look at the lyrics. You really don't want to listen to the song. You're going to see a little bit of the lyrics, and you're going to understand why I didn't play any of it, because if the weather holds and we can have an elders meeting this Wednesday night, I want to be able to keep my job after that elders meeting. See, we know the reality of how our culture deals with sexuality, what's out there. The question for us is, how do we as Jesus followers respond? And I think typically we have a certain response, but it is really only part of the answer. It's not even the foundational part of the answer. See, before you think of your answer of how we're supposed to respond, I want you to think with me through the Song of Solomon, chapter 4. If you have a Bible there with you or you want to click on it in our live campus, you can go to Song of Solomon, chapter 4. If not, you can just follow along on the screen. Last week, which I encourage you to listen to if you were out, we talked about the importance of the wedding in the life of the Jesus followers and the things we are saying through the wedding. Chapter 4, believe it or not, is all about the honeymoon. Solomon is speaking in verse 1 and says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind the veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. I'll just tell you right now, guys, don't use that line when it comes to Valentine's Day. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. And if you're thinking right now, he's saying she has all her teeth. That's exactly what he's saying, but remember, they're in a different kind of culture, no dentistry and things like that. Go down to verse five. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Verse 10, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils in any spice. Verse 12, notice, a garden locked, see that word, is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Now, I understand in verses 10 and 12, Solomon calls uh, his new bride my sister, my bride. And I've got to be honest with you. When I go, went on my honeymoon, the last thing I wanted to enter in my mind in any form or fashion was my sister. But that's a different culture. What he's saying is how we led up to this relationship is one of friendship before intimacy. He is saying that before she was his wife, she was his friend. See, that's how Christian marriages are supposed to happen. Friendship should be first. In any act of physical intimacy, we reserve for marriage. See, physical acts of intimacy, including prolonged kissing, are meant to create a bond for marriage. That's why it says in the New Testament, treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So if you kiss a boy or a girl before marriage, you're to kiss them like they are your sister or your brother until it's time to get married. And then when you get married, you kiss her like your wife, which is verse 11. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk, those phrase, are under your tongue. So what we call French kissing, not created by the French. It is much older than that. To all that Solomon says, you go down to verse 16. This is how his now wife responds. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat It's choicest fruits. And you're thinking right there, does that mean what I think it means? Bam, exactly. By that, she means exactly what you think. See, in the face of the immorality that is so common in our culture, God celebrates sex as a gift to his children. Hear that word. The Bible doesn't simply tolerate or allow Um, sex in any form or fashion. And what it does is it celebrates the beauty, sanctity, and joy of sex within a covenant marriage between a man and a woman. And we have to shout this reality in our world right now because it's not what we shout very often. It's not what is normally heard. See, what we hear in our culture today, what we even hear in the church, is one of two extremes. These extremes have been common throughout the history of humanity. Extreme number one, sex is a God. Little g, God. 
Go back to the Old Testament. There's a God referred to all the time called Baal. Some say Baal. It was the name the ancients gave to this supposed little G-God of fertility, meaning those who trusted Baal in their lives, trusted him for rain and trusted him for love. Baal was the God who promised sustenance through rain and satisfaction through sex. So Baal said unbridled sex, sex without boundaries, will provide love and it will satisfy the ache in our heart for love. So you ask, how did people worship Baal? They had sex. They watched sex. When they created a temple to the God Baal, which sometimes Israel did in the Old Testament, they created a place where people would come and observe and engage in sexual acts. Any kind of sexual acts you can think of. All the stuff you find on the internet today. Orgies, um, homosexuality, bestiality, bestiality, pedophilia, you name it, they did it. And that didn't go away in the times of the New Testament. The Greeks had a goddess by the name of Aphrodite. The Romans, a goddess by the name of Venus, worshipped in the exact same way as Baal. Come on, does this not sound familiar? Does it not feel familiar at all? See, I understand that we in the West today, we don't name our gods as they did in days of old. But when sex becomes the focus of our attention... When it's where we extend our energy and is the source of our identity, it is a God whether we call it that or not. And think about our culture. The most common euphemism we use for the sexual act is making love. So that phrase, making love, doesn't simply imply, but in a downright state, sex and love are synonymous. They are the same thing, that if I want to fulfill the aching of love in my heart, then all I have to do is have sex. We have websites that facilitate adultery like Ashley Madison. People are hooking up or they're friends with benefits or they find these crass personals that they can connect together. The Me Too movement is showing us how common sexual abuse has been. I understand there's some extremes in the Me Too movement, but come on, there's a lot of things we've learned about how common sexual abuse is in the lives of women, but also men often when they were children. Fastest selling book in the history of our nation was Fifty Shades of Grey. And you go to TV shows, and for seven seasons, Games of Thrones enthralled a nation. I mean, need I go on? I'm only beginning to scratch the surface. What you saw in the video, just a, a piece of it. I mean, come on. How often is sex connected with our entertainment? How often is sex connected to our advertising? I mean, what does a photoshopped woman in a bikini washing a car have to do with a Carl Ju- Carl's Jr. hamburger? What do models in bikinis have to do with sports? But the best-selling um, issue of Sports Illustrated to this day, each and every year, is the one with the bikini models. See, we all know the old adage, sex sells. Slavery connected to the sex trade. Very similar to how they created sexual acts in the temple of Baal, Venus, and Aphrodite. They did it with slavery. Sex connected to the slave trade in our world is not on the decline. It is actually on the rise in our world. I mean, come on. Sex without boundaries is a God in our culture today, guys, and we know it. And what we, the church, tend to do in response to our hypersexualized culture is just kind of talk about them out there. And what we can tend to do, if we're not careful, is to respond with another extreme, that sex is gross. Now, we may not use the word gross, but it's definitely what we can imply. It's definitely what I heard growing up. I didn't hear much about the subject at all. We never talked about the Song of Solomon at all. It's almost like that book didn't exist. But what I did hear about human sexuality was this, don't. Well, what do you mean? Don't. 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 What I, really the message I got was sex is dirty, sex is nasty, de- sex is vile, so save it for the one you're going to marry. For almost 1,500 years of church history, what the church taught overtly was that the more spiritual you became, the less you would want sex. That is included even in marriage. The more spiritual you are, the less desirable you'll find sex to be. Augustine is considered by many be, be the father of modern theology. Before he was a follower of Jesus, he lived a life of sex without boundaries. Sex was a God in his life. And in reaction to his former life, Augustine swung the pendulum, and he felt like it was the Christian's call to struggle against sexuality 
as against sin, even in marriage. In his book, City of God, which has laid a lot of foundation for theology today, he actually said, talked about the shame which attends all sexual intercourse. Another first church father, Jerome, said, if we abstain from coitus, we honor our wives. If we do not abstain, well, what is the opposite of honor but insult? You can find a period in church history of several hundred years where very spiritual people thought that the best thing they could do was have what they called a spiritual or continent marriage, which means they made a pact of virginity even with, within the realm of marriage, which absolutely violates the commands of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Other church leaders insisted that God required Married couples to abstain from sex during all holy days and all holy seasons. Couples were further advised that you needed to shun sex on Thursday in honor of Christ's raptures, um, Friday in honor of Christ's um, crucifixion, Saturdays in honor of the Virgin Mary, Sundays in honor of the resurrection, and Mondays in honor of the departed saints that have gone on before us, which is where the phrase came in, thank God it's Tuesday. See, I'm not trying to make fun of these guys. Well, I, I guess a little I am. But I, I am saying there's a lot we can learn from them. Hear that. There's a whole lot we can learn from them. But when it comes to human sexuality, what they did is they saw the extreme in their culture. They saw sex being worshipped as a god, and they swung the pendulum to the other side and began to respond with just the opposite. You go to the Victorian age. And they were very, very concerned about modesty. They thought if a man saw any part of a woman's body, that besides her face and her hands that somehow he might lust, including the ankles. So you look at the dress of the Victorian age and it came all the way up to the chin of a lady and went all the way down to the floor to make sure that they were ultimately modest. Then it was noticed, this is not an exaggeration, that table legs, when you looked at them, had something that looked like ankles. And so it became popular to make sure they had table cloths that covered all the way to the floor, lest a man would lust from seeing the ankles of a table leg. I'm not joking. Hear me. I'm for modest dress. We'll probably talk about it some next week. But if you're a dude and a table leg gets you aroused, get help now. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. You got issues in your heart that are not gonna be solved no matter how a woman dress. See, you hear the struggle we have, do you not? You kind of hear the extremes we go to. But I want you to know we can never grab hold of God's best on any subject by reacting to an extreme, by reacting to sin in our culture with an equally erroneous extreme. What we do is we examine scripture and we embrace what God says. And God, believe it or not, celebrates sex. He talks about it in the very beginning. The Bible, first three chapters of Genesis, opens up with the majesty of God. Everything God created, he just spoke into existence. And everything he made, day one, day three, day five, everything he made the first five days was good. But on day six, God created humans. And he created us differently than anything else. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, it seems strange to us to say, but our gender, our sexuality is somehow related to our creation in the image of God. And when we have removed ourselves from God, where have we struggled? We have struggled in the issue of sexuality, and now you're seeing it, though it's happened historically as well, we're struggling with the issue of gender in our society. By the way, the Bible is very clear about gender. Male and female, God created them. Hear me, sex was in the Garden of Eden and it wasn't the result of some accident, it wasn't the result of sin. See, I'm afraid some of us have this strange idea that God was creating things on day six and somehow he needed a little bit of a break so he took a break and went and got a cup of coffee and he came back and he looked over the edge of heaven. He looked out at the garden in Eden and there was Adam and Eve, you know, getting jiggy and such. And we, we think he just looked and says, oh my me. What, what a strange thing. I, I can't fathom, oh, oh my. That is the freakiest thing that I have ever seen. I mean, come on. Rudimentary anatomy says that is not the truth. Anatomy says sex was part of God's creation. But there is more. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Ask yourself a question. Why do we need to know this? 
Why do we need to know that Adam and Eve were running around the Garden of Eden in their birthday suits? With all that God could have told us, he, he gave us three chapters only about creation, about the Garden of Eden, about the origins of mankind, about our fall from our original glory because of sin. He could have talked about so much more, and yet he tells us this, that they were both naked and they felt no shame. Hear me, this is not about their clothing. This is about the reality of no shame. Hear me, sin did not bring sexuality into the world. Sin brought shame into our sexuality and such. The fall of man and sin entering the world didn't create sexual desire. Sin perverted and distorted sexual desire just like it has everything else God has created. So far from being human beings that need to do away with and repress our sexuality, we need to celebrate God's gift of sex. Our kids need to hear the celebration. Our people in our culture need to hear the celebration. Later on in the Song of Solomon, we hear Solomon say in chapter 7, verse 7, Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breast be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. That is celebration. And that is why at the end of day six, this last day of creation, the scripture declares that God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Sex, not just good, but very good within created boundaries. Very good. Now don't mishear what I'm saying. The creation of sex wasn't the epitome of day six. Sex isn't the essence of all that is good, but it is part, hear that word, part of what God created that was very good. Sex is this tool, one tool, this glorious gift from God to us to help a man and woman in marriage grow into oneness. For this reason, a man and a woman shall leave father and mother and be united to their wife, and they will become one flesh. The act of sexuality connected to our union together as husband and wife. When used as God designed it, used in the covenant between man and woman, it is not just good, it is very good. It is powerful and wonderful and glorious, and that's why we can't be casual with it. See, outside of God's created boundaries, that which is beautiful and wonderful and marvelous leaves people destroyed and empty. Jesus was once talking about the issues of our life and all the problems that we see in the world. And he was saying that, man, for something to change, we have to have something change in the heart. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Out of the heart comes murder. Out of the heart comes adultery, sexual immorality. These are what defile a person. He was saying we need to have a heart change. This phrase, sexual immorality, is a, is a, a word that just captures everything about sex outside of God's design for sex. Sexual immorality is pornography. In fact, in the original Greek language, the word for sexual immorality is porneia, from which we obviously get pornography. Did you know that pornography generates more money than all professional sports in our nations combined? Average age of exposure, parents, you better start talking to your kids, is at, at, between ages eight and nine. Because there are kids coming to school with iPhones, and they're showing things to your kids you don't want them to see. Sexual immorality is hooking up, it's friends with benefits, it's sleeping around, it's homosexual acts, it's what we call today open marriage, we old timers called it wife swapping. Sexual immorality is anything outside of God's boundaries for sexuality. These boundaries aren't because God's approved. It's not because God's a killjoy. It's because he loves us and he knows that there are things that are powerful within boundaries. We get that at some level. We understand there are things that are good as long as they're kept in boundaries. I've been tempted a couple of times with an idea that up to this point I've been scared to implement. See, what I was going to do is buy hundreds and hundreds of boxes of matches. And we were going to have children's ministry, which obviously we are not having today, but I was going to hand out matches to all the kids in children's ministry, preschool and up. Not only that, we were going to show a kid how to light a match, teach them about this, and I just wanted to see how parents responded. I wanted to see how many emails, text messages, direct messages, complaints I received. Now you know why I was a little hesitant in the implementation of the idea. And when parents complained, I was going to ask why. Now, isn't fire good? I mean, 
fire heats our homes, it cooks our food, it powers our cars, trucks, and SUVs. I mean, especially right now, if you have a fireplace, you're getting to use it in Abilene, Texas, like no other time that we can remember. It creates ambiance, it creates war. Fire is good, to which parents would say, well, well yeah. Fire is awesome, but you have to be mature and wise in using it. If you don't use it correctly, if not used within appropriate boundaries, it can become destructive and it can leave things empty and incomplete. Bingo! Which is why Solomon, in another book called the Proverbs, when talking to his son about sex without boundaries, sex is a god, he's talking about the mistress, the adulterous woman. He's talking about the prostitute. And he asked his son, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? And I would suggest it's more than his clothes that get burned. And it's more than just the body. There's a scarring of the soul. This is why the Bible says, flee from sexual immorality. Notice it doesn't say flee from sex. It doesn't say get real spiritual and never want that. It says flee from sexual immorality, not because God is approved, not because he's a killjoy. He commands this because he loves us. See, he knows, hear me, he knows how powerful and life-giving and beautiful and glorious sex can be when his children use it in the way he designed it to be used. It's why the Proverbs says, may your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. See it again. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the spouse of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May she he, all that he represents, may that be your satisfaction. May you know the joy God's saying that I created for you. May you ever be captivated by their love. And next week, what we're going to do, if the weather allows, we're going to gather together. Those who can right now will be online as always. We're going to talk more specifically about how this happens. How, how, how do we live this out? How do we live out what we see in the Song of Solomon? Because one of the greatest struggles in marriage, believe it or not, is sexuality. But sometimes, just, just be honest, even in Christian marriages, we've made sex a God. We've made it like the epitome of what marriage is supposed to be. And it's only a part, a wonderful part, a glorious part. But we can't have sex be a God. Sometimes we struggle in Christian marriages because we kind of raised with this hyper-legalistic idea that sex is gross. Nobody really actually said that to us, but that's the message we got. And I want to be really spiritual. I want to love Jesus. And I really want to love Jesus. And I want to be spiritual. I, I can't want this. And we've got to embrace once again. They were naked and without shame. We have to embrace once again that God looked at everything he created on day six. And he declared it is very good. And we need to model for our world. We need to model for our kids, our grandkids. We need to verbalize it in this day and age, what is very good, that God has what is good for his children. Yes, he withholds things. Every good parent does. Anything that's destructive, he withholds. No matter what our culture says, no matter how they bow to the God, Call it sex, call it Baal, call it Venus, call it Aphrodite. Matters not. We will not bow here. But we will not react with this extreme that's been the norm in the church as well. We are going to be a people who embrace what God says. We are going to be those who walk in all that God has for us. So right now, what I do, I've given us some time here, just a few moments. I want you to bow your heads. I'm assuming that most people listening in live are not 
in their car or anything like that. I don't want you to turn off now. Sometimes we can think that what I need to do is just listen to the message and process information, but that's not what we want to do. Right now, what we want to do is we want to allow God to do a work in our heart. Give me, give me the minutes here. Let's finish this up. We're almost done. This is the most important thing we can do right now. Ask God, what would he have you do with this? Some of us have to admit that we're bowing to sex as a God. Some of us are watching things online. We're having things as a normative part of our entertainment. And let's be honest, it doesn't even bother us anymore. I mean, some of us have to admit that if we had not watched that video in the context of church, it wouldn't have felt awkward at all for us. And the fact that something that feels awkward in church doesn't bother us when we're going to a movie or watching something on our television set, that concerns me about my heart. There's a hardening that can happen, and we scooch our way over. And some of us are beyond that, and we're at the place that pornography has become normative. It's becoming a part of our lives, things likened unto pornography, the images and such. Man, would we lay those things down, and we would ask Jesus to purify our hearts. Blessed are the pure in heart, Scripture says, for they're going to see God. Some of us are missing out on seeing God the way we say we want to because we're walking in a place of impurity. Now, don't hear condemnation. Jesus just wants us to have everything. He wants us to have the very best, and the very best we can have in any form or fashion is Him. Some, some of us listening right now, you're single. And really, we bow to sex as a God because we're thinking, if I never have sex, somehow something's incomplete. Think about this. Jesus was not only born of a virgin. Jesus died as a virgin. Jesus never had sex. And I don't think any of us would say Jesus was incomplete. Sex does not complete a human. Jesus completes a human. Marriage doesn't even complete a human. Jesus completes a human. And we have to come back and say, if God has called us to the place of marriage, then sex is this great gift to help us walk out of marriage that glorifies God and shows the world who he is. But if God's not called us to that, we don't bow to the God of sexuality. We don't think we're incomplete. Man, let's confess that right now and say, Lord, forgive me where I have bowed. And some of us, we grew up in strict churches, and there's nothing wrong with strict at times, but the message we heard was not one of celebration, but of vileness and nastiness and dirty. That's, that's the message we received. Reacting, we need to lay that before the Lord as well and say, Lord, I don't want to call vile anything you call beautiful. And I don't want to call nasty anything you call glorious, and I don't want to call Dirty, anything that you call clean. We want to be a people who embrace what God says. And in the context of what God desires, the man and woman were both naked and they knew no shame. There's a place we can walk with no shame. Come on, let's embrace that place right now. Tell the Lord, I am going to embrace what you say. We are going to celebrate where we are to celebrate. But we're also going to call impure and vile where sin has entered into this. We are no longer going to accept those things. We no longer will bow. Sex is a beautiful gift. It is a poor God. It's destructive when we make it a God. Let us lay our sexuality before the Lord. Let him sanctify it. Whatever impure thoughts we have, whatever those might look like in our lives, let him sanctify those. The goal isn't to become married and have sex. The goal is to be sanctified, set apart by God for whatever role he calls us to. Father, we celebrate with you all that you have created. Forgive us, O oh God, where we have called that which you declare to be very good, vile. Where we have refused to celebrate what you called glorious and wonderful. But Father, also forgive us where we have fallen 
fallen prey to what our culture does, and we have bowed before the idol of sexuality. Forgive us when things of sexual nature don't even bother us anymore because they're so common. The impurity that is so normative in our society. Make us a pure people, Lord. Not legalistic, not self-righteous, not thinking we're better than anyone else. We just want to think like you think. So I'm asking, Lord, as your word says, we do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Renew our minds when it comes to sexuality, Lord. And let us impart that to our children. Let us impart that to our grandchildren. Let us impart that to the generations to, that are to come. Let us be a people who embrace the totality of your word. We celebrate with you the gift that you have given to humanity. Humanity has done many vile things with it. But God, we will not let what humans do with your gifts determine what we believe about your gifts. We hear your word, O oh Lord. We celebrate. And I'm asking in marriages that are to come and marriages that are right now, that men and women may love each other, body, soul, and spirit, with the totality of who we are. Give us grace, Father, to live as you've called us to live, to be who you've called us to be. I ask in Jesus' name. And everybody at their home said, amen.